All right, so now we're joined by Catherine Wheatbrook, who's running for City Council District 6. So go ahead with a two-minute introduction. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me this evening. Uh, I am running for Seattle City Council District 6, which represents Ballard, Fremont, Wallingford, Crown Hill, Green Lake, Greenwood, uh, and uh, places in between. Uh, thank you uh, for the opportunity this evening to ask for your endorsement. Uh, I'm a member of the 36th. Um, and I, among others, have a rep, uh, the endorsement of Representative Gail Tarleton. I'm um, very pleased to, to say that. Um, I believe that being progressive is about more than having great vision and great aspirations. It's about taking the steps every day to uh, achieve those. It's the incremental steps. It's, it's moving forward. Um, it's looking for inner relationships and uh, making those small positive steps forward and on the ground results. Uh, I feel that my engineering degree uh, gives me a great background in problem solving, uh, that my 20 years in community activism uh, and projects uh, having to do with education, transportation, public safety, business districts, land use, uh, gives me a broad foundation on which to do this work, and that my recent activities um, in infrastructure, and in housing affordability, in transportation, um, and uh, smart growth uh, give me the current experience uh, to start being productive on day one. Great, thank you. So now we have our four prepared questions. Feel free to turn over the sheet of paper. These are okay. two minute answers. We're asking these of all council candidates. Uh, we left off with John. So, Sarah, will you start with number one for city council? Yes. Seattle is experiencing a housing affordability crisis. Several policy responses have been suggested, including linkage fees, incentive zoning, subsidized housing, and rent control, among others. What is your approach to keeping Seattle affordable? Uh, well, I'd have to nuance the question only slightly in that I think we've lost affordability and we need to re regain affordability. But um, uh, approaches are varied. I think we have um, a regional problem. Um, out, Seattle is part of a, a large network. Um, and we have to look at the issues uh, in a broader context than just in the city of Seattle. But direct approaches. Um, I think while rental inspections are a great idea, I certainly lived in a building um, with exposed wiring uh, you know, in college uh, and after. Um, I think that we may have discouraged um, a natural market for affordable housing of uh, as accessory dwelling units, of rooms for rent in homes as people age and they need a little bit of additional income. I think we may have inadvertently discouraged um, some of those naturally affordable rooms um, in our neighborhoods. Um, I think that linkage fees, um, whether you, you call them linkage fees or developer impact fees or um, whatever the, the actual technical mechanism is, I think we need to look at uh, holding developers responsible for creating some affordable housing and family housing units. We need to stop discouraging the two and three bedroom units from being built. And there's a number of, of mechanisms um, in there that, that cause that and that we can undo. Um, I think that there's some potential for incentive zoning to be very useful. Um, and um, I think that we need to be very, very cautious when we are building new structures, what we are displacing and accurately accounting for the affordable units that we are demolishing in the construction. Okay. Renee, number two. Last year, voters approved a levy to fund a universal preschool pilot program. After the pilot concludes, how would you fund the full implementation of the program? And what policy changes would you make to assure this plan addresses educational disparities in our city? Having been very involved in, in a preschool for the last 20 years, um, both as a board and as a staff member, uh, this is a, a question near and dear to my heart. Uh, assuming that the pilot provides the results that we expect, or can be tuned to provide the results that we expect and want, um, I think that it's going to have to start with another levy. I think we have some major education funding issues in the state. Uh, also, the state mandate is for K-12 education, not uh, the threes and the fours. So there's probably going to have to be some state work ultimately 
uh, to help fund. I think it's, it's important enough that it needs to be part of the state funding mechanism in the long term. Uh, I think that we need to look at the results of this plan, uh, of this the pilot project, and uh, look at best practices further to address some of the disparities. Um, I have some, some concerns over the programs that were selected. Um, you know, I think that they're, uh, they're not bad programs. I think that they are not um, going to address some of the disparities that we really want them to, and I think that there are some better selections out there uh, for that. So I would definitely be looking um, at, at the data, at the actual data, and making decisions based on that. Um, Michael, number three. Bertha is still stuck. What options does the city of Seattle have with respect to potential cost overruns, the waterfront, transit, and an unsafe viaduct? Boy, unsafe viaduct. I'm sure you saw the news again of the other truck that got stuck today and had it shut down for several hours. Um, <laughs> a couple of big wire spools got jammed under something. Um, I think the city is going to have to look at all the partners that were involved in this, and that's the tunnel partners, I think that's the state, I think it's the port, I think it's our own wallets, um, for potential cost overruns. You know, we've, we've got a big hole in the ground now, and we have a major transportation infrastructure problem in the city. Um, and <coughs> I don't know, you know, there, there's no, no tree on which money grows. So we're just, we're all going to have to look in and, and see what we can find. I'm, I'm heartened by the study results released, um, I believe, Monday that says they think they can bring it in, um, in the budget, that there's an expectation that they can. Um, I haven't seen the study, so I, you know, I can't, I can't uh, speak to the accuracy of that, but there were some very smart people involved, and I'm hoping that they're right, but we're going to have to look far and wide. On that and frankly I think we need to look at the manufacturer of the tunnel warning machine if there were flaws in that um, I think they they have some liability in that. Right. List number four. Because Seattle is the fastest growing big city in the country should we encourage or discourage this growth and what policy changes are necessary to accommodate the growth? We certainly shouldn't discourage the growth. Uh, I, I think that encouraging the growth uh, involves uh, creating the amenities and creating a livable community that re continues to have, uh, to extend Seattle's desire, desirability. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, we need to do a little bit of balancing as we add 10,000 people to a community, what amenities are there for those people? And it might not be the same amenities that the traditional neighborhood had. It might be that the younger generation moving in doesn't want an open park. They want a climbing wall. Or it, it, I don't know what those amenities are, but we need to be matching a little bit our um, the opportunities for recreation with just building housing or just building offices. Uh, and I think that can be a private partnership, private-public partnership. Uh, I think that transportation and adequate transportation to support that density is huge. Uh, frankly, on the campaign trail, that is the number one complaint, is it takes me an hour to get anywhere. Um, and they don't see it, they don't see it getting any better, uh, not in any sort of near term. And for us to continue to be desirable, I think we're gonna have to, to double down on transportation and figure out how to improve um, speeds of getting, not only to and from work, but to recreational activities, to shopping, to school. Great, so now we'll open it up to follow-up questions. Uh, these are one-minute answers. Uh, I have a question, then Clayton, then Jeremy. And Mike. Um, so I, for years, I've always asked this question of um, challengers to incumbents. So you're running against an incumbent. Mm -hmm. uh, no one has is entitled to any particular elected office. But um, is there a particular reason why uh, Mike O'Brien should no longer be on the council? I think 
think Mike O'Brien makes a fantastic at-large candidate. He has a lot of vision pieces, um, and I admire him for that. And if he were running for a citywide position, I would probably be voting for him. Uh, I have experienced, and I continue to hear, that there are lack of boots on the ground attention to neighborhood issues, whether it's preserving trees, uh, whether it's preserving uh, established groves of trees, whether it's dealing with um, development issues, mitigating impacts of development that are actually prohibited in some cases, um, but are not being enforced, um, that there's, there's a lack of engagement. And I think that a district level representative needs to be someone with a proven track record of engaging the community. Uh, Clayton and then John. Um, can you can you tell us something about about uh, the reasons you went into engineering on one hand, mm -hmm. and the reasons um, a generous time later perhaps you have decided to go into public life? Engineering is a family tradition. My father has two degrees from the University of Washington. Um, I and what kind of engineering? Um, he is mechanical engineering. Um, I ended up, I started as mechanical engineering and transitioned to um, an interdisciplinary degree in engineering uh, because what I discovered, environmental impact statements, public policy analysis, water quality control, structural analysis, impact analysis, process design, that is actually where my heart was. It was, it was, the, it was the understanding the technical and being able to communicate that to different audiences and to, to understand the intricacies of a public policy or of a design or the placement of a bridge um, or the placement of a school relative to a park or a highway. That was a fascinating part for me and I thought I wanted to write environmental impact statements. Still haven't written one, read a bunch of them, uh, but um, it was that analysis and that problem solving um, that's brought me full circle to uh, public life. John and Michael. Okay. Uh, on the uh, question of affordable housing, mm -hmm. you seem to have avoided the rent control question. Mm -hmm. How do you, yeah. how do you okay. think about rent control? I think I ran out of time. Okay. Um, uh, rent control is a great concept that I have not seen actually be effective. Um, you look at San Francisco and New York, New York excuse me, um, and it feels like a lottery. Those people who got in early and got those have affordable rents. If you weren't lucky, right, you'll never get there. It does nothing to control, it, it's great in the short term, but it does nothing long term to address the issue. And, and I think it would be, um, I, I think we're seeing that it is actually damaging and it creates more expensive housing. Good answer. <laughs> John likes your answer. Uh, so, so Michael, then Liz, and then Sarah. Um, your opponent, Mike O'Brien, is a big proponent of the Honest Elections City Initiative. Mm -hmm. What's your stance? I think I was the third person to sign the initiative that went around at the 36th District Democrats uh, meeting last month, earlier this month. Great. Liz, and then Sarah. I just wanted to know which department you wanted to work with each council member is still tied very closely with the department? It'd probably be transportation or land use. I see them as very intricately tied, so it's hard for me to say A or, or B. Um, but I would actually work, frankly, to establish a standing committee to look at breaking down the silos between, within and between departments to get some interdepartment coordination um, kick-started. And, and I think that that's a perfect opportunity for a standing committee. To me, yeah. like planning and development? Um, I think education, planning and development, we don't have right now schools in our comp plan, and I think that is a huge problem. And I'm personally working on getting them in the new comp plan, but um, we need to be tying all these different pieces together, and there is no committee that addresses that at this point, and I think that's a, a huge problem. Sarah? You mentioned that congestion and gridlock, um, and to me at times one of the number one concerns of residents and folks you talk to. So what are your solutions and what do you think you could do as elected to address that problem? So we've got short, medium, and long-term issues. <laughs> um, I'm going to pick on the long-term one first. Um, I think where we are going to have light rail, 
we need to be identifying the locations and securing that property today. So in Ballard, which is going to grow up, we need to pick where that right spot is and hold it there, just that one spot. And we need to look at the zoning and all the pieces around that. So as we're planning our bike routes, our ped routes, our pedestrian improvements, that we're all going towards a known location rather than creating a great bike route that's now 12 blocks away from where the light rail station is. So that, that's the long term. Um, short term, I think we need to uh, get with a program of parallel paths for different modes of transportation so that we're better utilizing our street space. We have time for a couple more questions. Renee? Could you address anything you could share about ideas for social services provision at the Northwest sector? that right now doesn't have any identified provider. That's a huge challenge up there. Um, I have been most successful in creating new organizations or new structures when I go out and I look for that little gem we haven't found and we, we build it up, that little ember, that somebody out there who's already coordinating, trying to bring things in and struggling with the lack of a network Right? Who knows what the lack is? Who has that very well defined? And you know, frankly, it's going to get down to funding. You know, it, it's dollars. Um, the people doing the work have to be able to pay the bills, their own bills. We can't rely on um, the faith-based community to provide any of this or any meaningful long-term part of this. I don't think. Um, and uh, I, I found it very successful to go out in the community and find people who are already working in. These areas and nurture that, fund that. Additional questions? So I have one, and this is um, sort of a fun one. So the, <laughs> the, the council just appointed a, a ninth council member um, from eight finalists. I'm curious, uh, did, did you have a favorite uh, among those eight who were who oh, the finalists? Oh, <laughs> thank you. I I told you it'd question. be fun. Vote for that. <laughs> So I think there are a lot of strong candidates in there. Um, and they all had different um, aspects that they brought to the table. I only personally knew or had any conversation beyond a, a public meeting. Um, one, it was Noelle Frame, and, and I think she's a, a bright star in our future. Uh, and I wish the opportunity could have gone to her, but I think we did well. Great. Time for maybe one more, Mary. Um, you said you had some concerns about the preschool, and mm -hmm. I wondered if you mm -hmm. wanted to be more specific. About sure. That. Um, the philosophy that um, I'm most familiar with with the two is Piaget and Montessori, um, and it's uh, it has a lot of hands-on component. Um, it's a lot of learning by experience, um, and there are definitely learning modalities in children that are best addressed by that. And it's actually um, in, when I was selecting preschools for my child, um, I looked at um, how different programs meet the needs or fail to meet the needs of different learning modalities. Mm -hmm. And the hands-on experience of learning generally outperforms the more rote, standardized education. Um, and you're gonna tend to see, and this is, you know, generalizations are always tricky. Um, lower income boys being best served by experiential. And they say they're, that they're going to use play. Mm -hmm. But you've taken a closer look than I have, I think, I suspect. And My jury's going to be like out. To see more. <laughs> I'd like to see more. I would like to see more. Can you tell us? Hold on, hold on. So we're actually... Yes. Yes. Modality they chose. So off, off, off the record, we can talk about that more, but we are out of time. Okay. We want to take 30 seconds for a closing statement. Um, thank you very much for your time this evening. I've enjoyed the conversation and great questions, um, and I look forward to receiving your endorsement. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you.